when people talk about how the pay in hospital in Australia is not that good. And I just want to say shut up because I worked in Canada where it's that tipping culture, much like America. So it's really like, you know, one of the things that was nice about working at hospitality in Australia is I could pay my rent without having to show up to work in a plunging necklace. Like I'd ask my boss for a raise at places in Canada and he'd just be like, you know, show more skin. I'm Danny Vallant and this is Dirty Linen, the podcast that takes the issues the hospitality industry finds hard to air in public and shakes them all about. One of the things that I think we've realised as we've we've been talking to different temporary visa holders who are in Australia and working or perhaps not working in hospitality is how different all their stories are because the categories of visa are so complex, so varied, and of course, everybody has their own personal story. There just simply isn't a mould that visa holders fit in. And that's why when the Prime Minister, as he did in early April, says something blanket like, go home, if you can't sort yourself out, then go home. It just strikes people in all kinds of different ways. It has many different meanings. It's a statement that simply doesn't make sense for someone like Anna Bailey. Uh, Anna is a dual British Canadian national. She's been living in Melbourne for a couple of years. And when you hear her situation, you'll realise how easy it is for people to simply fall through the cracks, not only here, but in the other countries that they've lived. So, Anna, welcome to Dirty Linen. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you for sharing your story. It's an interesting one. Do you want to outline a little bit about your situation? Yeah. So, um, I was born in the UK to a British father and a Canadian mother. And then when I was 12, uh, we moved to Canada. And I was there till I was about 24. And then I left and I was doing some traveling. I was living in Argentina before I moved to Melbourne. And now where I sort of stand is like, when the pandemic hit in Australia, so actually just to backtrack a bit, (laughs) So when I first came to Australia, Australia has reciprocal agreements with certain countries, and one of them is the UK. So when I first got here, I decided I would go and register for Medicare because the government website said that I was eligible to. And then when I got to the Centrelink office, they said, you haven't got a British address, you're not eligible. So then I had to sort of mad panically try and figure out health insurance, which was a horrifying experience. And yeah. Because insurance companies don't communicate in plain language. Um, And then, um, you know, so then I dealt with that. And then when the pandemic hit, when you're hearing go home, um, one of the issues that, like the big issue I found myself in, and it was quite terrifying, was um, in Canada, if you're out of the country for longer than a year and a half, you lose access to your healthcare. And you don't get it back unless you go back to the country. And I think you've got to be there for three to six months. It depends on the province um, before you can reapply for it. So it's quite a long process. And in the UK, because I'd been out of the UK for so long, if I went back to England, I don't really know that many people there. Like I've got my family members, but I'm not eligible for the NHS right away either. So, and it took about six weeks before we got confirmation from the health insurance companies that look if anything happens you're covered for COVID but that was quite terrifying six week window. Yeah just to think that you might not be covered here and that there was nowhere else that you could go where you would be looked after in that way because I think a lot of people perhaps would look at you and say oh you know you're you're British or you know you sound British anyway you're white uh, you know there are so many English people here like you're probably fine but it just wasn't like that for you, was it? No, not at all. And it's one of those things where sort of when you share, when I kind of tell you what I've told you, um, a lot of people are quite shocked because so, for example, like what I know that I could, what I knew that I could do is that if I had to go to the emergency room, if I took my British passport, no questions or ar- no questions asked, you're covered under reciprocal health. But then it would be if I had to overnight in hospital, that would have maybe been a bit of a gray area you know if my insurance company hadn't clarified if that makes sense yeah and what was your employment situation like talk a little bit about that what happened when COVID hit so I was working for a hotel company and in the food and 
beverage department and so much of the hotel's revenue was dependent on big conferences. So we were obviously hit quite early on in the pandemic when more people were cancelling their flights, not wanting to travel. And then the first thing the company did was get rid of anybody who was foreign, pretty much. So I didn't have that job. And I had a, a small side gig tutoring ESL, but that came to a pretty abrupt halt as well. Um, yeah, when I, before that, I'd been working in hospital for a while. Yeah. So y- you felt that, I mean, you were working casually, were you? Um, at the hotel company, I'd been there for about six months as a casual, yeah. I guess it quickly became clear that there weren't government benefits that were being rolled out here that you'd be eligible for. Um, yeah, that became pretty clear, but I also wasn't particularly surprised, if that makes sense. Like, it was kind of... It's shocking because of the language that was communicated, but I've been in Australia for a while and I volunteer in the refugee sector in Australia, so I'm no stranger to the fact that government that the government doesn't want to help people that aren't Australian. Yeah, well, <laughs> you, I know that you're a volunteer at the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre, so I guess there's no, you would have seen and heard no shortage of uh, distressing stories about the way that some migrants are treated here and the way that they're left out and lo- lines are drawn in places that make it, um, that make people feel very other and not included in the, uh, the lovely concept of Team Australia. Yeah, but that, yeah, it's like I've obviously heard some horrible and distressing stories, which I'm not at liberty to discuss, obviously. Um, Of course. But um, it's it's interesting when you come to Australia as like a visa holder, because like I had, I met people who'd gone to Canada on working holiday visas. And what a working holiday visa meant was just like you can live and you can work and you pay taxes. There wasn't quite the amount of restrictions in place on everything. So like, with working holiday visas, you're not considered someone who lives in Australia. You're a working holiday maker, which is what you have to click on the tax form, which is not confusing at all. And then, you know, one employer for six months at a time, which a lot of people find loopholes around. Um, And then, for example, with like student visas, um, you know, there's the 20 hour a work week, uh, 20 hours a week, work restriction but then I know people who are from what Australia would consider more desirable countries who say came to Australia with their husband to do a master's degree um their husband or partner doesn't have restrictions on how many hours they can work that week but I know people who um their partners have the same restrictions as them work-wise, even if they're not students. And they're from what would be considered a less desirable country, if that makes sense. So you're saying that there are, um, I mean, are you saying that there's racist applications of these rules? Oh, 100%. So like, if I came to Australia with a husband, he could work 40 hours a week, no questions asked. Someone from, you know, not a Commonwealth country um, or Anglo-Saxon country or EU member state, their partner would only be able to work 20 hours a week when they're, you know, the primary visa applicant is studying, then 40 hours a week during school holidays and then back to 20 hours a week. So there's so many conditions that are attached to every every application that it's quite different. So, you know, Team Australia is almost like trying to get onto an Olympic team in many ways. <laughs> yes. Because they like to differ you as much as possible. Yeah. They put a lot of <laughs> hurdles in front of you. So do you think there are stereotypes around the different types of, of visa holders in Australia? Oh, 100%. Like when I first got to Australia and I was applying for a job, like I'm a little bit of a nana. I like being in bed at 10 o'clock with a cup of tea. Um if you say you're British and you're on a working holiday visa, everyone just assumes you're an absolute pisshead who just wants to, you know, work for a little bit and then go on a bender in Queensland, which, you know, I'll be honest, I did that when I was 21. I was on exchange in Brisbane and I I went to the beach and I enjoyed escaping Canadian winters. But the fact that you say I'm a working holiday visa and they just assume associate you as this 
party monster piss head, it's not fun. <laughs> right. And then as a student, a lot of people assume that like, um, like I'm doing my master's right now at Swinburne Uni and we have a very international cohort. And, you know, there's the stereotype that, you know, international students have pots of money. But a lot of the people in my cohort are on scholarships like myself. So it's amazing to think that you're on a scholarship. Does that actually, does that mean that your fees are reduced or waived or does it actually give you a stipend as well? Um, it just means my fees are reduced. So I pay about what Australians pay. Okay. I don't get a stipend like some unis have specific scholarships. And I remember when I was applying for my master's, I looked at doing Macquarie Uni in Sydney because they had scholarships they said full scholarships for British citizens. But I decided, oh, God, is this going to be the citizen versus the resident saga again, which I've already dealt with so many times. So I decided not to apply because I just didn't want the headache. Right. I mean, how much energy do you feel like you need to put into jumping through all the hoops and negotiating all the different rules? I mean, is, is it is it a sort of – has it been a constant during your time in Australia that you've had to deal with? Um, it's been pretty constant during my time in Australia. And, look, obviously part of this is self-made. I could have chosen to stay in Canada, but that didn't feel like me. And I felt – I don't know. You, I felt a gut feeling to move to Melbourne, so I did it. Like, And it's – the more people ask you where you're from and where you live, the more you just want to go, shit, because it's like, <laughs> like when you're like me, you don't really know where you're from anymore. And doing visa applications get more and more complicated because from my most recent one, it was like, where are you from? What's your citizenship? Do you have another citizenship? What's your primary country of residence? And because I was listed as a working holiday maker, I'm like, and that's what I have to click on the tax form. Even though I've been renting an apartment in Melbourne for two years, I'm just like, I have no idea what I'm doing with this and I'm just going to wing it and hope for the best. Right? Yeah. It, it, yeah. It's, <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't gel with the life that you're building for yourself. I mean, you're studying for a master's, you've you built a life here, you're definitely not um, backpacking around the place. So yeah, it just, but it's, it's funny. It's like really trying to squish square pegs into round holes, isn't it? It yeah. just doesn't, it just doesn't align. There's also something that you discovered um, about tax and the way that the Australian government taxes working holiday visa holders. Can you talk about that? So last year, um, I think it was the High Court in Australia, I can't remember off the top of my head, um, they found that the Australian government had been illegally taxing citizens from 11 countries. And I can't remember them all off uh, the top of my head, but one of them was the UK and one of them was the United States of America. And by illegally taxing, I mean that citizens of these countries um, are being taxed 15% in Australia when citizens of Australia don't pay taxes on working holiday visas or pay very little um, when if they went to go and live and work in the UK, for example. Okay. I well, I, th I think it was also that there's a tax-free threshold for Australian citizens where you don't have to pay tax until your income exceeds, I think it's around $20,000, whereas the, the um, people on working holiday visas who were working here were taxed 15% from the very first dollar that they earned, um, which then which breaches a, an agreement, a reciprocity agreement that the working holiday visa holders will be taxed as, in the same way as the locals. So um, it was a breach of that agreement. Um, but I think I don't think anyone's actually been paid back any tax. Do you, have you heard of anyone actually getting any money back due to this finding? Um, because the government's trying to appeal it and they... In as we've talked about, there's nothing more that the current government loves doing than othering people and making all sorts of awkward exemptions and rules. So they were saying like, oh, yeah, but there are some people who have actually been living in Australia and not, you know, on working holidays, even though they've been on a working holiday. And from my understanding, what that means is there's people who haven't been 
you know, moving every three months, which is what the government wants you to do. It's why they have the six month kind of, you know, the six month work restriction and the three months on the farm. They want you to keep moving. Well, they want you to pick fruit and do, and do some of those agricultural tasks that um, that Australians aren't so keen to do. Yeah, which I did. I did tree planting in East Gippsland. How was that? I had a body like Lara Croft, so I got to eat like an entire loaf of garlic bread every night and not feel guilty. Amazing. Uh, I'd say I had one of the better experiences. Like, bec- like so because forestry is so full on, like you're climbing uphill 22 kilometers a day, planting 1,500 trees a day once you get the hang of it. Um, it's really physical work. Um, <laughs> so, look, it was an in it was an experience. I didn't particularly enjoy it, but my bosses were all like, every Friday they'd be like, "You guys have done a really hard, difficult thing," and they'd buy a slab of beer and we'd just drink it in the nearest park. So I think I had one of the better experiences. Was the pay rubbish? A hundred percent. But were my bosses fair and reasonable? And they were like, "If you if something's hurting, just call it a day. If you've done what you can for the day, that's fine." So. That sounds better than a lot of the stories I've heard, which is people living in disgusting conditions, working incredibly hard. It's actually really hard to make any money because, you know, you've got to, uh, you, you know, you've got to pick however many kilos of whatever it is before you even get above zero. And yeah, it just, it just sounds like there's a lot of exploitation out in the regions for when working holiday visa holders head out there. Have you heard some stories like that? Oh, I've heard so many. And it was one of the things where like, I was really terrified about trying to find work. And then it was just, I think so much of trying to find farm work is just luck and chance. And I got really lucky. Um, but the other thing is with doing something like forestry, it is much more physically laborious than fruit picking. But uh, in Victoria, everything was owned by like, Basically a private company. Like the tree planting I was doing was to make paper. It wasn't to save the rainforest. Um, But um, like, so for example, my first day was with a physiotherapist about how to take care of your body whilst you're doing this job. So because it's through a really big forestry company. So there's a lot of regulations because like it is a dangerous job. And like sometimes you're like, putting a shovel in front of your face and pulling yourself up a mountaintop and you're like, oh my God, this is so not safe, but I'm just going to walk really fast and I don't care if all my trees are dead. Because it's just pay what you can. So you just hand in the trays at the end of the day um, and then they just count how many trays you did and then calculate how much you actually made. Like Towards the end of it... um, (laughs) I remember like you'd ha- cuz if you had half a tray left you weren't allowed to count that. So I remember we'd all take these trees and hide them in our trousers and then we'd get in the car and as soon as we got, you know, out of the convoy we'd just start throwing them out the window. <laughs> so like if we had half a tray we'd empty half the tray, hide it in our trousers so that we could get paid for a full tray. And then, you know, just throw them in the bin at Macca's. I love just, it. Well, look, it was like 15 cents a tree. So, like, yeah, like your oh underpants were covered in dirt. And this was a good job. This is this was one of the lucky jobs. So that's pretty yeah. crazy. Um, Anna, you, you've you've worked hospo in various places around the world. Do you want to um, give us a little rundown on on what how the Australian industry compares in your experience? Well, um, one of the things I find really interesting and sometimes difficult to listen to is. Um, when people talk about how the pay in hospital in Australia is not that good. And I just want to say shut up because I worked in Canada where it's that tipping culture, much like America. So it's really like, you know, one of the things that was nice about working at hospitality in Australia is I could pay my rent without having to show up to work in a plunging neckline. Right. Like I'd ask my boss for a raise at places in Canada and he'd just be like, you know, show more skin. Whoa. Or the other thing is if you worked as a waitress in Canada, you had to, um, uh, if you didn't make enough money in tips, you had to kind, like if it was really slow, whatever, like you had to kind of pay out of your own pocket to make sure the kitchen got covered for tips as well, which is just revolting. That's not right. That's terrible. 
Um, it sounds quite dimin- diminishing as a as a person, like to be, yeah, that that's really tough. I mean, did you did you do that? Like, did you show a bit more skin so that you could make a bit more money? Yeah, I did that when I was a barista in Canada. So, because that's what I was doing, was like I was baristering, and then I had friends, like I had an Aussie mate of mine who was working as a waitress at a pub, and she, she's the one that told me about the whole. If she didn't make enough money in tips, it came out of her bank account to cover the kitchen. Um, but yeah, I would definitely show a lot more skin. I'd have to be like perky, and obviously, like the, being a barista, you're meant to be perky, which I'm more than happy. Like you know, it's fine. Like being a barista in Melbourne's a different ball game, though. Because you're like royalty. You're like neighborhood royalty. <laughs> yeah, like you're like, um, and especially like I've worked in very affluent areas of Melbourne where people spend $70 a, a week on coffee. And they'll be like, no, I want you to make it because the other girls don't know how to make the coffee how I like it. So entirely different ball game. But I noticed more racism in the hospitality industry in Australia, though, than Canada. Like Canada, you have to mo- show more skin. But at one of the places I worked at, which I'm not going to name, um, that's the worst place I've worked in my entire life. And some of the things that I saw there and how some of the staff were treated and how me being white as a barista was making more money than a qualified chef from somewhere else. Um, that shouldn't be happening. And I... I I wouldn't wish anybody the experience of working for the company that I worked for. That's really that's really shocking to hear. And I mean, was there any pushback on that? Like, did anybody say anything? Was there any effort to change that situation? Well, people kept quitting. Like, I lost count of the amount of chefs we went through that year. Um, I was the one that tended to speak up most because I made very good coffee, so they couldn't really get rid of me. <laughs> But also because um, a lot of people just didn't feel comfortable speaking up. So I sort of felt like, this isn't right. I'm going to say something. If they have a problem with it, fine, I'll find another job. Do you think it's? Do you think that the, all the things that you've been through have turned you into a person that's able to speak up? Or do you think that it's uh, just something inherent in your personality? Um, probably a combination of both. Like, I've always been like a little bit of like, a loud mouth <laughs> and quite cheeky like you know being you know being from England we're not afraid to kind of call call bollocks right like <laughs> well it depend, depends on where you're from in society like I like to say like in England you get that mm, yes cup of tea spectrum of society and then you get piss off wank face at the other end <laughs> and I would say I'm closer to the more piss off wank face like just yeah <laughs> So I don't know. I think it's one of those. But I also feel like if you're doing a bit better than other people um, and you know that you have a certain level of privilege and that if you say something, the chances of you getting in trouble are, you know, going to be less severe than other people. I think it's kind of like, why wouldn't you use that platform for something good? Mm. And so can you relate that to why you've volunteered for the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre? Um, well, I was volunteering in the refugee sector in Canada for about four, um, maybe about a year before I left. And then I did work with women's groups in Argentina and I was on a uni placement in Tanzania, volunteering there as well, dealing with kids with severe disabilities. But um yeah, it's, I'm also like, my background is in history and politics. And so you see that for, with that, you hear about all the injustices in the world. And, you know, one of my motivations to volunteer at the ASRC is, you know, this is going to go like, what, 20, 30 years from now, this country will be apologizing to refugees for the way they were treated much like they apologise to the stolen generations. And at least I can say I was on the right side of history and I did my bit to do something better for people in really difficult situations. Mm. Uh, How are you feeling about stage four and where Melbourne is at the moment? Honestly, I'm relieved. (laughs) Um, 
I was having a conversation with a mate of mine and I was talking about how the leaders of the world are very much like George Costanza and Frank Costanza. <laughs> you have the guys screaming serenity now and trying to put a blanket on it like Frank. And then you have the Georges, which are like, it's not a lie if you believe it. And so I'm hoping Daniel Andrews' latest attempt at serenity now does something better, but... um I don't know. It's frustrating watching how selfish people are. Like, and yeah, I don't know. I'm happy that we're in stage four. Like, my life really isn't much different. I'm still unemployed. I'm still getting all my food from you and creating wonderful meals with that. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it's, I don't know, it's shit, but it's fine. If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. I, you know what? I think we're going to need some T-shirts saying it's shit but it's fine because what what choice have we got but but to continue. So I'm just going to um, backtrack a little bit with a couple of footnotes for the listeners. So the Costanzas are, that's a reference to Seinfeld, which is a, a sitcom that if you are locked down with a bit of um, – with a bit of streaming, then you can watch Seinfeld and get into that Costanza vibe that Anna's talking about. And when Anna says that I've been feeding her, that's because uh, she's uh, been an attendee at the Attica Soup Project, which supports temporary visa holders in Melbourne and is extremely glad to do so. And I have to say, Anna, you sent me a photo via Instagram of something that you made from your grocery bag and uh, it looked absolutely delicious so you obviously know your way around a kitchen as well as a coffee machine yeah um well for my master's degree like um because it's media and comms one of the units was video production and so you know um one of the things one of my lecturers said to me and I think this is actually just really important in general is what happens right now is either going to make you or as a creative, or, you know, it's going to cripple you. So, you know, for a video production class where I had no access to cameras, I made a documentary on my smartphone about what Nigella Lawson has taught me about life, myself, and food. We need to see that. Can we all see it? Oh, I, need, oh, I, I can get someone to re-edit it. I don't think I can bring myself to look at that footage again. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, can you can you give us, a, give us a few things that Nigella has taught you? Um... That it's okay to not go with the crowd. Um, you know, like Nigella's, like, you know, people talk about her being over, overly, sec- like, overtly sexual, but she's just passionate and she's excited about food. And I think now more than ever, that's so important. Like, so I try and get in the habit of having at least one meal I get really excited about once a day to like sort of treat myself right so it's like um yeah like food should be exciting like yeah we can't go outside right now but that doesn't mean you can't make yourself a very nice meal very inexpensively either so that's one thing that I learned from Nigella Lawson um that also like you know the notion of clean eating is really toxic Um, Because, you know, it applies that if you eat anything that isn't, you know, healthy or matches dietary standards, it's dirty and it's sinful. But like, you know, sometimes, you know, you need to eat something that's good for your soul. Like I've told you, there's been a couple of times over the course of the pandemic, I have had cookies and wine for dinner and I have zero regrets. Did I have a raging hangover the next morning? Absolutely. But did I need my cookies and my wine? Yes. (laughs) <laughs> Aldi wine <laughs> of course so <laughs> <laughs> there's so many ways that, that food can nourish us and it certainly doesn't have to be yeah because you've uh, applied yourself to the any kind of food pyramid um and yeah full respect when you when people talk about clean eating it just makes me want to eat chocolate pudding and yeah as you say crack open some wine so I think it's uh yeah it's silly silly and damaging uh, which isn't to say we, you know, shouldn't all be eating lots of nice veg. That's important too. But, um, yeah, there are lots of different ways of looking after yourself. Yeah. But, like, if you want a bucket, like, if you just want, like, chicken and chips, like, have the chicken and chips. Like, um, but I, lo- I think also, like, Nigella Lawson is, she's so wise if you listen to her, how she talks about food and community and sharing and, um <laughs> I I think one of the things I love about her is she's so human. Like when you watch a lot, like if you watch as many cooking shows as I do, um, 
she like a lot of people kind of try and perfect everything's perfectly portioned everything's perfectly organized everything's perfectly sliced um and Nigella's running around just going oh sod it I'm impatient and she just throws it all in and I love that like you know there's for a celebrity she's incredibly grounded in the way that she cooks and she's like she's not only a celebrity she's like posh as shit like her dad's I think um, in the house of lords or something but you know she just goes I'm impatient and I need brownies for dinner and I think it's important to have those characters that you can like connect with during difficult times like right now yeah yeah beautiful I love that Anna um look you know what it's been so great to talk to you I think I'm gonna go forward from this conversation with shit but fine um as a little bit of a mantra and um yeah as as I've been saying a little bit through these conversations the pandemic is not ace at all, but it has allowed me to meet some really great people and uh, that definitely includes you. Thank you so much for being part of Dirty Linen's chat about temporary visa holders, Anna, and bringing your unique perspective to the conversation. I'm happy to do it. Like, I first definitely, like, I think shit but fine has been my motto for this entire pandemic and one of the things I do when I wake up in the morning is I just lie in my bed and I just scream, everything is fucking fine and then I just feel better. (laughs) Oh my God, life rules. That is awesome. I love it. (laughs) All right, look after yourself. You too. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about. We spend a week thrashing around each issue, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This is a Deep in the Weeds production. <laughs>